Yes, we can. Good evening, doctors. It's a great pleasure for us from Shield to welcome each one of you for today's webinar. And I thank Dr. Girija Wag uh, for sparing her time and uh, accepting to be a speaker for today's program. And I request our doctor, Dr. Prachi, to introduce Dr. Girija Wag and over to Dr. Prachi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Palaji. So yes, uh, welcome doctors. Good evening, everyone. And uh, before we begin, uh, we are happy to inform you that Shield has to develop a new digital platform called as Shield Connect. And I would request Chitrakala to play the uh, AV of this uh, Shield Connect. Chitrakala. Thank you, Chitra. So this uh, digital platform is a one-stop destination for educational activities, data dissemination like these webinars, and it is not only for the key opinion leaders, but also for other practicing doctors and caregivers and patients. So may I request uh, Dr. Gereja Vag to click on the link uh, and to inaugurate uh, this uh, uh, digital platform. Ma'am, there's a link below uh, on the screen. Can you please click on it? Yeah. Uh, yes, I've just clicked it, madam. Chitra, can you help uh, help you out? Yeah, it's loading. It's loading. Yeah. So yes, there are various blogs. And it is not only for the doctors, but it is also for the patients and the caregivers. Uh, 
Kaman's photograph is also there. Thank you. So without uh, further ado, uh, it's my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Girisha Vaag. Actually, ma'am needs uh, no introduction. Uh, ma'am is director of Girisha Hospital and Fertility Center in Pune. Also consultant, uh, Cloud9 Polo Hospitals in Pune. And professor of Option Gynecology in Bharti Vidyapet Medical College, Pune. Mom was chairperson of uh, Medical Disorders in Pregnancy Committee of FOPSI from 2013 to 2016, and also joined uh, Secretary of FOPSI in uh, 2010. Mom is a recipient of many awards. Uh, Mom uh, received Trupta Umranikar Award for first in MD in 1992, also Anandi Bhai Roshi Award for Excellence in Medical Services, and Mom has uh, had a specialization in organic endoscopy as well. So with this, uh, may I request uh, Dr. Deja Ma'am uh, to continue with her talk. Thank you, Ma'am, and over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prachi, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you, Shield Pharma, for giving me this uh, platform and the opportunity. And most importantly, congratulations for trying to be uh, with times and trying to create such a platform where there can be a exchange of knowledge and I must congratulate Mr. Balaji for taking on a new uh, responsibility at the end of the uh, company. And that is something I'm sure that we are going to take uh, Shield to a better height under his leadership. So the task that has been given to me is to speak about the poor ovarian reserve and the oocyte quality. And I'm going to be speaking a little differently from what has been expected till now. So I hope I'm audible, Dr. Prachi. Hello. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Very much. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. So, if you look at the diminished fertility and poor ovarian response, actually is a conundrum which poses a huge challenge to the experts in the field of reproductive medicine. And there is limited knowledge about the risk factors of diminished ovarian reserve other than the iatrogenic ones. What happens is, is many a times the woman would not have any eggs, potential eggs, which can grow either. And this can give rise to maybe no follicles forming when you stimulate them or they can't generate any follicles on their own. Now, historically, if we decide the first description of a patient who was a poor responder occurred 28 years ago, and this was in 1983, and a patient responding with a decreased follicular response and low estradiol levels to ovarian stimulation by FSH as well as HMG was reported then. And this resulted in few oocytes being retrieved and few transferred embryos. And therefore it has been a belief that we try to push in medicine, still the woman is unable to make, uh, you know, respond the way we are expecting her to respond. So this diminished ovarian reserve is actually a leading cause of infertility identified today and one of the most frustrating ones because not only does it cause a, a sub sort of a response or a suboptimal response to whatever has been given, but it can also alter the endometrial receptivity in tandem and therefore generally challenge the fertility success. And this DOR is characterized by either low number of eggs in the ovaries itself and or with poor quality of the remaining eggs. So even if there are eggs in the ovary, they are not responding and impaired development of the existing eggs even with ART. Now, a good number of such women with low ovarian reserve may conceive with their own eggs, actually, if they are given individualized treatment and is tailored for their profile. So we have to actually look at every woman and probably identify, and I think it's high time that we probably decided to make such kind of an algorithm or such kind of a checklisting wherein we can be able to identify that these are the women who would probably require a little different kind of an approach. And these patients should be counseled appropriately for an aggressive approach towards achieving fertility. And sooner the treatment is started, the better the chance of pregnancy are. And this is a very, very personal observation that I have made. And every forum that I get an opportunity to talk about, I always want to say this, that many times obesity and heightened insulin resistance 
I has been identified according to me. Also, I feel that it is responsible for this abnormal ovarian response or abnormal ovulation response to induction. And many a times when you do these corrections, these patients are found to conceive spontaneously, even in one of the most gravest situations. I have had a series of patients with very low anti-mullerian hormone levels still conceiving and taking on their pregnancies very well with spontaneous conception with these little tweaking. And therefore, I feel you believe that this requires to take, uh, get into attention. Now, if one looks at the follicular dynamics and physiology and through the life stages, there are a number of total follicles are the highest when the fetus is in utero when less than 28th week of gestation and then at birth there is a continuous process of uh, atresia which has been seen and at birth is born with quite a few number of eggs which further becomes atretic with a sort of a determined quantum of about lakhs at the time of puberty and further throughout the entire lifetime, there's a gradual attenuation or atresia of these giving rise to a complete depletion of these primordial follicles from the ovary giving rise to menopause. And through ovulation, in the entire lifetime of a woman, we could probably lose about 400 to 500 eggs. Now, so if you look at the stages of folliculogenesis, it is gonadotropin dependent primarily, where the primordial follicle turns into a primary follicles and goes on to preentral follicle. Now, many of these on this journey from the primordial to the primary to the preantral undergo a loss and atresia. And this is one window which requires our attention. And then there are gonadotropin independent further things because once the folliculogenesis goes into uh, a sort of a self-regulated uh, mechanism, it will go on its own to reach ovulation. So if you look at the possible mechanism at the origin itself would be reduced number of primordial follicles, increase in the atresia and altered follicular maturation. So surprisingly, we'll find that women have the most eggs when they can least use them prior to birth at 20 weeks fetus. After birth, this oocyte pool dwindles until very few remain at the time of menopause and ovarian reserve testing specific for the quantity of available oocyte. So that is how we test in our clinical practices. So you can see in this graph here that there's a normal decrease of the ovarian reserve over a period of age. There is lower ovarian reserve set prenatally with usual, unusual, uh, usual one postnatally and lower trajectory of ovarian reserve during the adverse postnatal environment or nutritional challenge. Now, this is something that we have to look at a little more seriously. And this is the time when there would be irregular cycles and eventually menopause. And the same kind of a setting can happen in women who are having their ovaries under stress due to so many other challenges such as obesity, environmental changes, or many other iatrogenic serious factors. Now, how do we look for this ovarian reserve and when to measure and what are the findings? So the commonest one currently used and sometimes even a little over abused is the AMH, that is the anti-mullerian hormone. And this is a hormone which is secreted by the basal granulosa cells. And therefore, it does not require any timing of the menstrual cycle when it has to be measured. And it can be done anytime, especially especially except for not while you're pregnant or using any hormone-based medications. And the abnormal value is identified to be when it is less than 0.8 to 1.9 nanograms per millimeter cubes. Antral follicular count is essentially done on a transvaginal scan. And ideally, it's to be done between the cycle day two to four when there is absolutely no action of the inherent FSH on the patient's body and therefore that's the ideal time. And if it is found to be less than six to 10, then this would be a subnormal or an abnormal anti uh, uh, AFC. Estradiol done on cycle day two to four with the test of FSH. And if estradiol is found to be more than 80 and if the FSH is found then more than 10 on this cycle, then this would tell us about 
the poor reserve. Now, of course, we have to interpret it in the context of the woman's age also, because if you look at the uh, anti-mullerian hormone especially, you must interpret it correctly in context of the woman's age, and that is what we have to remember. Now, whenever we are talking of the AFC, we have to also understand that the size of these antral follicles would also matter. Sometimes you would have a high AMH, which would be peculiarly seen in polycystic ovarian syndrome patients, or sometimes very high AMH can be a sign of a malignancy or a malignant condition, giving rise to pre-ovulatory follicles like high fertility and slow reserve depletion, low AMH giving rise to high fertility, rapid reserve depletion. And a similar kind you can see here that if you are finding that the size of the AFAC is small, is big, but it is the quantity is less, this can also give rise to low fertility, slow reserve depletion, and there can be a moderate fertility, rapid reserve depletion, and all these things would matter, have to be correctly interpreted. Now what challenges the ovarian reserve of a woman? Exposure to chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and many times it may be extra genital tract uh, or reproductive tract cancers also. And if such a thing is going to be happening in a young woman, it's always a good practice to go in for choosing to do oocyte retrieval or maybe freezing of the eggs for future use. And that is something, cryopreservation is something that we must encourage in these women before they embark on any of these things. But if they have already undergone that, without such an opportunity, they are at risk of reducing their ovarian reserve. Genetic abnormalities such as 45X of FMR pre-nutritions have been found, especially in women who have an unexplained premature ovarian failure. Smoking is extremely detrimental and we all know that women may not proactively tell in an Indian setting that they are smoking and that has been identified as one of the reasons. Previous ovarian surgery also can be a cause and especially we are seeing that many times you, have, you do a cyst excision or maybe endometriosis surgery can deplete the ovarian reserve or even excessive ovarian drilling if it is done for polycystic. And today we know that there are very strict stringent guidelines and based on which only one should practice such a surgery or an intervention on the ovary. Uterine artery embolization and ligation can also alter the ovarian reserve because the blood supply to the ovary can get affected. Autoimmune disorders like Addison's disease, galactosemia, any kind of viral infections, especially mumps or any oophoritis, or salpingectomy when done for an ectopic pregnancy or hydrosalpings are known to cause infection, inflammation, and avascular insult on the ovary. Huge amount of environmental factors, and I would like to say stress, obesity, high insulin resistance are also responsible and FSH receptor polymorphisms have been identified in some patients and there can be a lot of idiopathic causes which can challenge the ovarian reserve. And the risk factors would be an advanced reproductive age and in all the studies that have been done, age has been identified to be one single factor because as we understood that there is a continuous process of atresia which is going on and it gets compounded as the woman's age advances. Family history of early menopause is extremely important thing to note. Genetic conditions and there can be a fragile X syndrome, conditions that can cause ovarian injuries such as endometriosis, pelvic infections, previous ovarian surgery. I sometimes even feel excessive stress can be extremely detrimental to ovary because ovaries and testes, according to me, are very, very delicate organs which have been created by nature. And any such kind of stress would definitely alter the functioning of these particular uh, organs. Oophorectomy, of course, history of gonadotoxic therapy or pelvic radiation and smoking. So when we are looking at the various mechanisms in which we are looking at the ovarian reserve, we can see that the anti-mullerian hormone would be secreted and would be present all throughout the cycle, while AFC is the one where we would be able to look at the 2 to 10 millimeters of antral follicles in the ovary. Inhibin B will be found somewhere here, 
maybe on the cycle day seven or so, and the later part of the ovulation in the large uh, uh, follicle, and FSH also is found to be responsible. And these are the various places where we have to look at interpreting and what are these people are influencing the folliculogenesis. Now there are certain low prognosis groups which have been identified and group one and group two uh, and group three, four based on various features. So if the woman has an age of less than 35, AFSC of more than five, AMH of more than 1.2 nanograms per ml, then she will be if subgroup A less than four, subgroup four to nine, AFC, and this would be group one patient. Group two would be age more than or equal to 35, and AMH, AFC seem to be okay and be classified depending again on less AFC and more AFC. Age more than 35, again, group four here, where the antel follicle count is less than five, AMH is less than 1.2, and in group three, less than 35, AFC less than five, and AMH less than 1.3 nanograms per ml. So age, then ovarian biomarkers such as the AMH and AFC, and the number of oocytes retrieved if previous ovulation stimulation cycle reports are available would help us in identifying and classifying these groups and then identifying them as low prognosis groups. And these are the ones where then you will be using and tweaking your protocols for IVF, such as by using the GNRH antagonist protocols or agonist protocols with previous ovarian uh, kind of a, um, down regulation and then further on trying to stimulate the cycle. Now this down regulation today, there has been a whole lot of understanding that instead of using estrogen and progesterone combination, it is better to use only progesterone therapy for the better outcome in these cycles. So what are these? Finally, these patients would, group one patients are younger patients and will have a standard ovarian stimulation and would have a better result while the ones which are older patients, we will have to use a better protocol. Now, this is important to classify this because not only does it give us guideline, it helps us in prognostication and it helps us in identifying the results of the treatments that we are using. Before the Posidon classification, there was this Bologna criteria which was proposed. And this was the one which helped us in identifying the PORs. The two of the following three features must be present, such as advanced maternal age of more than 40 years or any other risk factor for pre poor ovarian response, or less than three or equal to sites with a conventional ovarian stimulation protocol, and abnormal ovarian reserve test of ORT or antral follicle count of less than five to seven, or AMH between 0.5 to 1.9 nanograms per ml. And as I mentioned, that these are the various ovarian reserve tests which will be performed, age, the menstrual cycle characteristics, basal AFSE2, AMH, inhibin B, which is something which are not very commonly doing nowadays, Looking at the ovarian volume and the ovarian blood flow can also give us certain insights. And then the dynamic test where the clomiphene challenge used to be given or exogenous FSH ovarian response test or the GAST test, these are now not used very commonly, but they can be something which can be documented whenever you are using stimulation for the woman who has been recruited into the ART cycle. Now, this criteria got it criticized because of the diversity of the risk factors included, such as pelvic infection, endometrioma, ovarian surgery, and extensive periovarian adhesions, as the impact of each of these factors on ovarian reserve is highly variable. And Ishray consensus is acknowledged as the most important step towards a uniform definition of POR, and that these criteria be used in any future randomized controlled trial involving intervention strategies for poor ovarian responders. Now, the goal of an ovarian stimulation, as we all understand in IVF, is the recruitment of multiple follicles in an effort to compensate for the inefficiencies of embryologic culture, embryo selection for transfer and subsequent implantation, and hence poor response to ovarian stimulation usually indicates a reduction in the follicular response, resulting in a reduced number of 
retrieved oocytes. So the now can we think a little differently is something that we require to look into because whenever we are using this stimuli, we are trying and accepting that yes, this is going to be the amount of primordial follicle. This is what we have at hand and we are trying to enhance this particular thing by whatever is already produced by the body, by trying to mimic the same bodily function by exaggerated stimuli and getting an exaggerated response. So that is what we really do. But then we can consider a little different approach. As we look at this particular diagram here, that we see that there is a continuous atresia which is going on here in this particular cycle. And this granulosa cell apoptosis is a continuous process, but does it, is it always normal? Is something that we need to identify. If you look in a healthy patient, we will find that there is a gradual apoptosis which will continue and then after the granulosa cell becomes fully luteinized, it will undergo apoptosis. But in an abnormal apoptosis, there can be an early loss of this granulosa cell and then it will get reduced. Or there can be a late apoptosis because of functional mitochondria. So therefore, these apoptosis gradations, degrees, also may be of a difference which we require to look into. Apoptosis is type 1 cell death in the post-ovulatory follicle and in an atritic follicle, there can be autophagy or type 2 cell healthy. So these are the two types which have been identified. And why do we need to study follicular atresia? It has to be studied to understand the clinical relevance and also for biological relevance, for quality control and cell sacrifice. In clinical relevance, ovarian pathologies like premature ovarian failure could be associated with accelerated atresia. And PCOS can have repressed atresia. And in IVF and embryo transfer, exogenous ovarian stimulation may cause rescue from atresia. And coasting will give an opportunity of oocyte retrieval from early atritic follicles. And these are therefore important to understand. Now, there are various influences on atresia, such as molecular, cytoskeletal, and metabolic influences should provide considerable insight into the examples of these influences, which include microRNA regulation, cytokeratin filament expression, and oxidative stress control, and so on. These factors, in turn, are of biological and economic significance because they impact other aspects of fertility also. And once identified, they may hold the key to therapeutic improvements in treating infertility and poor reproductive function. So going back to the follicular genesis, female reproductive function requires cyclic development and maturation of ovarian follicles on a background of continuous activation from the pool of a primordial follicles. And these are formed before birth and represent a population of germ cells from which recruitment for growth occurs throughout the woman's reproductive life. And this is what we have learned and understood that there is, these are the stages of follicle development from primordial to ovulatory. All growing follicles just must be activated from the finite resting pool of the primordial follicles. Where there is initiation of primordial follicle growth and development to the preantral follicle stage. Formation of antral follicles where expansion to the preovulatory or graphene follicle is associated with granulosa cell proliferation and antral fluid accumulation within the basement membrane and rupture of the graphene follicle release to cumulus oocyte complex at ovulation in response to mid-cycle LH surge. So these will determine actually the quality of the egg that is going to finally form, which is going to be e able to yield a quality embryo and a quality implantation. So everything would depend on this particular process, if you ask me. So in vitro, there are several approaches have been taken to develop human follicles in vitro with the use of fresh and thought cryopreserved human cortical tissue. And it is now clear that if we are to achieve complete development of human oocytes, a dynamic multi-step culture system is required to support each of these transitional phases. 
because the majority of follicles within the ovarian cortical tissue are quiescent primordial. So the first consideration of an in vitro generated system should be to optimize initiation of these primordial follicles in vitro and support early follicle development and identify what are the issues that are causing influences there. The factors regulating follicle initiation and early growth are still not well defined, but the process requires a combination of inhibitory, stimulatory, and maintenance factors. And there have been certain animal studies which have shown the importance of phosphatidyl inositol 30 kinase, AKT signaling pathway within the oocyte in regulating this follicular activation. And you can see here that this particular activation system seems to be influencing the primary follicle recruitment and maybe to an extent influencing even the atresia. PTN inhibits activation of the primordial follicles and mTOR C1 promotes the activation of primordial follicles. Now, thus, mTOR C1 can be inhibited pharmacologically with rapamycin and stimulated by leucine, while the manipulation of this pathway could have important clinical applications in the field of fertility preservation and fertility enhancement. So now this, if you look at the regulation, would be by nutritional and other factors. mTOR signaling is stimulated in the granulosa cells of select primordial follicles leading to the secretion of KIT ligands and these in turn bind to its receptor in the oocytes to promote downstream P13K AKT signaling and secretion of oocyte factors GDF9 and BMP15 acting back on the surrounding granulosa cells. These oocyte factors stimulate receptor serine kinases and SMAD signaling leading to cell growth proliferation and follicle development. So mTOR signaling is stimulated in the granulosa cells of select primordial follicles and it leads to secretion of K1T ligand and these help in secretion of GDF9 and BPM15 and these would be influencing the cell growth, proliferation and further follicular development. So this has been identified to offer a benefit when prescribed before ovarian stimulation, the following two things can be observed. One, antral follicle count more than seven and AMH level more than 1.1 nanogram per ml. So while we are buying time to optimize the patient's condition through various things such as correction of any comorbidities, weight um, optimization, optimization of the male factor, immunization, vaccination. It would be a good practice to prescribe these patients with this particular leucine. And this is in the form of mTOR and which is given for six to eight weeks before ovarian stimulation. And it will be also beneficial till the time that patient is making because it's not very easy for our patients to go in and jump on to choosing ART practices so easily. And till the time that you're optimizing, buying some time to optimize the woman's health, this would also be a useful um, preparation for this optimization. It can also be an extremely important adjuvant as in order to improve. Also, if you decide to embark on an IVF cycle, this can act as an effective adjuvant to help improvise the ovarian response. So this would help in improvising the granulosa cell which would secrete the KIT ligands and give rise to formation of GDF9 and BMP15, stimulate the FSH receptors and improvise follicular genesis. So at the end of this all, I would want to thank you for having uh, giving me this uh, opportunity and a patient hearing. And being a teacher, I choose to communicate the truth, choose the reality of life. I choose to heal and not hurt. And I choose education over ignorance and I choose the power of peace. And in the world, teacher service lies perfect freedom. And I'm always very, very grateful 
for the opportunity given to me by God to become a teacher. And therefore, I take this also opportunity to solicit your support as the Vice President Foxy. The elections are from the 1st to the 10th of September on the Foxy website, which is an online election. Thank you so much for a patient hearing. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. So uh, there are a, a couple of questions over here. Uh, so let me read out. Uh, but first of all, uh, I would uh, like to know uh, whether uh, we can share your recording uh, to the audiences. So that was the first question. Yes, yes, uh, you can, please. You can share it with the audience and share it with me also. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, ma'am, definitely. Okay, dear Riddhi, I am typing my answer for Riddhi here. She has asked a question whether it's an OD dose or a BD dose. The dose is OD. Uh, the next question is about any contra in, in, uh, contraindications for uh, mTOR treatment. No contraindications. No contraindications. And uh, whatever I have used in my practice, I found a good uh, compliance from the patients. There are no adverse drug re uh, uh, effects that I found. The only thing, if at all, the Shield Pharma can help us with this is a little expensive for the patient sometimes. <laughs> but then... It's just once a day a dose, so right, it does have a lot of benefits to it. Mom, would you recommend all the patients with uh, poor ovarian result to start uh, with this treatment and then uh, do further? Rachi, uh, I will tell you my recommendations. Uh, all patients who have uh, any history of endometriosis, any history of PCOD, anyone who is because you know i also do ivf but i do it very selectively yes. most of the patients i try to choose to get them into a pregnancy based on especially age has to be a factor which gives us this opportunity wherein we try to uh, you know completely depend on their own uh, egg result to try yes. and enhance it so therefore whenever i find that this is basically going to see poor ovarian response is something which we diagnose as a laboratory diagnosis or a biomarker diagnosis but we can do something which is called as a clinical diagnosis based yes. on the menstrual cycle looking at there are so many other uh, comorbid factors in such patients i start them on the therapy till i'm optimizing the rest of the things you will not believe but i would want to tell you that i use myoinositol extremely rampantly both in pregnancy and polycystic patients for this simple reason because i feel it has a place in asian ethnicity and many a times uh, it has helped to an extent because somewhere just by doing dietary modification, weight loss, lifestyle changes and adding to it such kind of uh, treatments with leucine uh, et al. This definitely helps in bringing out a conception on their own to an extent or at least improvisation in whatever ovulation induction you are going to practice. Uh, then, uh, of course, what you must also remember is you must not waste the patient's time. Always categorize them, classify them correctly, and then embark on such kind of a treatment. Otherwise, you may just miss on patient's valuable time. So, because time is also something which is important in the, uh, you know, yes, you are. Yeah. Right. But what is, uh, Prachi, what is very, very um, sort of gray zone is atresia, the rate of atresia, whether it is getting compounded, what is influencing it. I have a feeling that all these factors must be influencing it. But there is no way in quantifying these things. And also, if you look at the premature ovarian failure is on one aspect, but even early menopause is such a challenge in Indian women. We are having such an early age of menopause also. Right. And therefore, you know, when women choose to get into a pregnancy a little late, we are really concerned because they are going to be having some sort of an atresia already set in. Correct. So not much time to do the uh, various... Uh... Correct. Yeah. 
All right, ma'am. But we totally understand there is a need for additional data and uh, additional uh, answers. Yeah, but so, the beginning has to be there somewhere, isn't it? Correct. We keep on creating for data to come because if you can look at the example of progesterone, it went uh, from the market because there was no data to support it. It's come back again and now it is here to stay and there are so many modifications that we are seeing. And then we keep on feeling that you should not deprive our patients from something which is beneficial. So if it's not going to cause any harm, it can be an effective adjuvant. Yes, ma'am, I absolutely agree. Uh, the next question is, can we combine mTOR with uh, DHES? So we uh, don't have data, ma'am. You can I, have... Fortunately, there is no data and uh, I don't know because uh, we do not know what they will cause to each other. Correct. That is one. And uh, I don't know, I have not been very, very proactive in using DHES in my patients. So I am... I have used loose in very, very rampant. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, wait for any more questions. Uh, uh, audiences, uh, uh, we encourage you to post your questions in the chat box so I can submit those questions to ma'am. Uh, so thank you, ma'am. Uh, there are no more questions uh, from the audiences. Thank you for your faith on mTOR and uh, sharing your personal experiences as far as uh, this uh, difficult to treat uh, patient group. So it was an excellent uh, presentation and uh, thank you for allowing us to share uh, your um, link. Also, we'll sharing with uh, uh, in a form of a link to this uh, recording uh, with the audiences. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prachi. Thank you, Mr. Balaji, and wish you all the best for your new venture. Thank you. Thank you, Veda. Thank you very much. Thank you.